Welcome to the WWE Podcast Mailbag. It is Thursday, August 4th, 2022. And now that SummerSlam has concluded, we get to hear from all the listeners' emails and voicemails to hear what you guys have to say and looking ahead to Clash at the Castle. So let's just get everything going right now. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. One that everybody wants, me. Mickey, let's, let's go to WrestleMania. Playboy, Austin 316 says I just ripped your ass. This is my iron. You're going to acknowledge me. And welcome to the WWE Podcast Mailbag, everybody. Thank you again, as always. We're about to jump into your mailbag, meaning this is the show for you guys. If you haven't joined us before and you're brand new on board for SummerSlam, then thank you very much i've gotten uh, several listeners that have joined us since the SummerSlam event and boy let me just say this i have i'm going to do a separate show maybe i'll do a separate video on youtube or <laughs> tiktok or something uh i don't know something where i'm going to respond to some of the negative reviews and i know some people out there oh, would say you're too big for that don't give them the time of day you don't need to respond to negative reviews all that stuff uh nope i i will i will dive into the mud and i'm going to respond to these negative reviews that are calling me racist and negative. It's, it really runs the gamut. And not that I really am personally offended. I actually don't care what if those people write reviews that are negative. It's fine. But I think it's entertaining for people who are podcast hosts to respond to negative reviews because you can't respond to them. Because a lot of the Apple Podcast reviews, I have to say, there's no way for the, the actual creator to respond to these. So I think it's only fair that those who are writing the negative reviews have, a, have, a, have their, their 15 minutes of fame. You know, So it's funny that those that are calling me negative also write negative reviews. Bit hypocritical, crit, hypocritical, huh? So, all right. But anyway, thank you for joining me. And if you haven't joined us on Patreon, do it because it's a great way to connect with other wrestling fans. We have an entire chat room on Discord where you can... Uh, you can talk with other people during events and it's open 24 seven as well as hundreds, if not almost a thousand for free show or free shows, uh, nearly free ad free shows for a dollar a month, patreon.com slash WWE podcast. And the last plug I'll say is DuPont network, the DuPont network. I know that I'm driving this home, but I want to really just make sure you guys are on there because it allows you to, Get free live TV, but also see me every Saturday at 8 p.m. with a live show, or rather a um, pre-recorded show, but it's video that nowhere else is available. So you, you can't see this on YouTube or anywhere else. It's DuPontNow.com. All right, let's get into it and start with our patrons who get priority here. And it, the first email is from Grim Reefer. He says, Grim here, Judgment Day and Edge and the Mysterios. Out of the possible four outcomes you mentioned in your Raw review, I don't know if you picked up on Ray's promo when he was talking about how he used to tag with Edge and how they were champions, and he's such a great guy. That, and Edge's promo saying he's going to destroy the Judgment Day. I see Dominic turning and Edge and Ray going after the Judgment Day. I don't think they will be successful. They will probably get a concerto out and be out for a few months. I think they'll give Judgment Day six months, then decide whether or not to keep them together. So that's, yeah, I mean, the thing that's going to be most interesting to me is the Dominic turn. You know, I still would have loved Edge to be a part of this and have Edge be the one to coerce Dominic to the dark side, being an evil SOB, turning his own, turning Dominic on his own father. I would have absolutely loved that. But if I could just get a Dominic turn, hell, I'll take that. Um, oh, and by the way, guys, I I do apologize. If you hear the noise in the background, I don't have an oppor- I don't have a choice here. <laughs> My office is right so- outside of our bathroom. Uh, and our bathroom is getting completely gutted and demoed and, and redone. So I, I, there's no real quiet time for me to do this. So if you hear the noise, I'm trying to talk over it if you do. But uh, so we'll have to just get through it together here. But OK, so Grim, I will say that I like this. I like, you know, that's a good a good pickup that you made that I didn't about Ray's promo talking about how he used to tag with Edge when they were champions and he's a great guy and Edge and Ray tagging together 
to go after the Judgment Day is definitely a scenario. I mean, definitely plausible and likely. The one thing I think you're going to see, the big turn that I think is actually going to happen, if Dominic's going to do this, and my God, I keep saying this, that if they're going to do it, it's got to be here and here and here. But they're having golden opportunity after golden opportunity, and they got to take one of these. I think what's going to happen, you're going to be right in some respect, Grim, where they're going to have a six-man tag match where it's Edge and the Mysterials versus Rhea and um, the Judgment Day where uh, we have Finn and Damian Priest. Uh, Now, I know that Rhea Ripley is a a woman and they'll have to work through that, but I think the big turn is coming at Clash at the Castle where we have the Mysterios who are about to tag in Dominic and Dominic turns on somebody causing him, you know, turning on his father, hitting edge with a chair or something. And then Dominic turns and uh, joins the judgment day that I think is coming at clash at the castle. And I think that's going to be so much fun to watch. If it's not, if it's not that, I don't know what this whole point of edge accidentally spearing Dominic on raw was like, why are we doing this? If that's not going to be turning into anything, right? So, We'll have to wait and see, but uh, I like where you're headed, Grim. All right. So you go on to say the big question in all of this is what does Rhea Ripley do? Bianca is tied up with Bailey, which isn't going to be a short feud. Does she keep on jumping people backstage? There's only two women's championships and the women's roster starting to fill up. I've heard Sasha and Naomi could return uh, shortly, and hopefully we get a return of the tag team championships and possibly a mid-card belt. I would like to see a women's tag team championship on Raw and Intercontinental on SmackDown. The size of the roster now needs a change. A lot there, Grim. <laughs> you touch on a lot. First of all, let me address Sasha and Naomi. I have heard as well that Sasha and Naomi are going to be returning and that Triple H has done a nice job of of maybe uh, softening the relationship between both parties, bringing them back, realizing their worth, all that stuff. I think that's going to be something that is that does come to fruition. I do believe Bianca and Sasha, now that Vince is gone and Triple H and Stephanie are, are really uh, running the company, that they do return. And I, I wholeheartedly hope that happens. Um, so does what, what does Rhea Ripley do? You know, I, I do think we get Rhea and Bianca. I just don't think it's right now. Um, it, it'll be one of those. It'll be one of those hold me over type of programs. And I, I hate to say that because Rhea and Bianca is a lot of fun and they are so good together. But Bailey is a bigger star. There's no doubt about it than Rhea Ripley. And I think that they know the money match is Bianca and Bailey. But when do they get to that match? You know, maybe they blow through it before the end of the year, and then Rhea Bianca is WrestleMania. But I, I, I mean, I, Rhea is coming. Rhea is next in line for Bianca, and I think that happens probably late year into the fall in the winter time. You get Rhea and Bianca because they have to go back to it. They can't just tease us, tease the Bianca Bailey program from now till WrestleMania. That's way too long. So that's what I think. Um, now. There's only two women's championships yet. Well, yeah, the women's roster is filling up. But until they show me that women can have programs that don't involve championships, consistently show me that, I don't want more championships. Because everything that's going on doesn't need to be a championship. doesn't have to involve a championship. And some, In fact, some of the most memorable programs and matches of all time have nothing to do with championships. And... I think that adding a women's, adding a, a mid card championship, adding tag team championships back, if you do that, you are going to 100% make sure every match that happens on Raw and SmackDown be about some championship. And that shouldn't be the case. Unless you're going to give the women a much more sizable piece of the show where there's like four or five rivalries going on. You, I mean, that's not going to happen, at least in my mind right now. That to me is too much right now. Uh, you know, they need to show me that they can consistently implement the women's championship, or rather the uh, the tag team championship, in a consistent manner whenever they bring them back. Um, you know, because they did a very poor job overall, a poor job of implementing the tag team championships on a consistent basis. So, uh, yeah. So, thanks, Grim. Let's get to our next patron here. And it is the current European champion, 
Alex, the French guy, and he says, I've been listening to your podcast, but I don't know why I thought about something when you were asking, when are they merging the championships on Roman Reigns? Um, I don't know if WWE is aware of that, but if they do, could they spoil Roman being the greatest universal champion ever? It is dumb but simple. If they merge the championships, the universal championship is gone. Roman holds a brand new belt. Oh, I see what you mean. You actually physically mean the two belts being coming one. Got it. Uh, So Roman holds a brand new belt being the undisputed champion. And if they do that, no more 800 days as universal champion because it doesn't exist anymore. So this is another reason for Roman to drop the WWE championship to build other big stars and be the very best universal champion. What do you think about that? Au revoir. Did I say that right? Probably terribly with an American accent, which means see you soon in French. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the extent. Au revoir and uh, like bonjour is uh, that's that's it. That's all I know is see you soon and hello. <laughs> I, I will. I would not survive in France unless it's Paris, right? Because cities usually have uh, English speaking. Uh, most uh, it's kind of a mix, right? I'm sure it's kind of like when you. You go to Canada and you go to like Montreal. People speak French, but a lot of people speak English, so you wouldn't have to worry about the the language barrier. Anyway, so I I believe the reason they haven't actually merged the championships into one, physical physically, I mean, not just metaphorically, is two things. Number one, they like the visual of Roman Reigns holding two belts. It looks more dominant. It, it looks in their minds better. Uh, just like why the Usos are having to hold two belts. So I think when you have two championships that a guy is holding, two belts anyway, even though it represents one championship, the perception is that it looks more dominating, that the guy's holding two belts, even though it's one on paper. The reason they're not rushing to merge the physical championships is that that's reason number one. Reason number two is I still believe they're going to take one of them off of Roman somehow, some way, and bring it to Monday Night Raw. I think Triple H has heard that complaint loud and clear, and so that's why they're also not doing it, because while on paper it's merged, they could use the storyline to say, well, he has one championship, but they're they're able to see some kind of loophole in the contract where, okay, he lost to Drew at Clash of the Castle, but did you see the loophole in this? It was for the WWE Championship, not for you know, the WWE undisputed universe, like they could find some silly loophole. And again, I don't care how they do it. I don't care if it's sloppy, if it's awful, if it doesn't make sense, if there's logic uh, that doesn't apply to me, I will let this one slide as long as we get a championship off of Roman. So that's why I think they're doing it because they're going to, they're planning on taking one of the belts off of Roman and bringing and splitting the uh, championship back to two belts. I think that's what they're going to do. The other thing though is, How are they going to implement the draft this year? Do they have a draft? If they have a draft, there can't be two championships. So do they just quietly end the draft and they just continue with what they're doing? I don't I don't know, but they need to figure that out because if the draft effectively ends and the brand split ends, you can't have two top belts because there's one show. You want one top guy, not two. So there's a lot to think about, but I think that's the reason is it looks cool. It looks more dominating. It's perceptually more pleasing to like pictures and things like that and posters and and marketing with Roman to hold up two belts with fireworks going off every single pay-per-view. And uh, the the fact that they are going to plan on splitting the championship metaphorically and they've already got one of the championships or they have two belts for it. So Roman could just drop one belt and keep the universal. So that's what I think is going to happen. A bit complicated, I know, but that's the best that I could... uh, muster there all right let's get to let's see here uh oh i know let's get to randy randy the patron or just the patron and he says what a summer slam man i enjoyed that so much after bailey and her crew came out i thought right away uh all women in order i was excited awo oh 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 i got it <laughs> awo all women in order corny i know but was excited do you think Sasha joins Bailey or comes back with Naomi and goes with Bel Air? I think you're going to have Sasha and Naomi come back to combat Bailey uh, because Sasha coming back is people are going to cheer the hell out of that right away. 
you already have Bailey come back as a heel. You need a dancing partner, and I think Sasha going against Bailey is a lot of fun and something we haven't seen in a while. So I think that's what happens. I, I doubt that Naomi and Sasha come back as a tag team. I, I, I don't think they would, but you know and we'll, that remains to be seen. Plus, there's also Charlotte looming out there. There's a, there's a lot to look forward to, guys. I mean, they're, they're, you know, I know those people are tired of Charlotte, but she's been gone long enough where if she comes back, it it would feel fresh. So, but I think Charlotte should absolutely be a heel. And if Sasha comes back, or rather, Charlotte comes back as a heel, as she should, you can't have also Sasha as a heel, Bailey as a heel. I mean, you got to have somebody beyond Bianca uh, to uh, balance it. Okay, Becky turned babyface, but it still leaves a little bit of an imbalance. So Sasha comes back as a babyface, Naomi comes back as a babyface, and uh, they maybe they team with Belair, but. The problem is both of them are on SmackDown, at least loosely on paper. Sasha and Bailey, or rather Sasha and Naomi are on SmackDown. So that's probably where they'll go back to. So, all right, next, Brock and Roman match. It was good, but I hope we're done with them. Do you see Drew beating Roman or Theory cashing in? Whew. I've alluded to this on you know, almost every show that I do about this, this topic and a clash at the castle in about four weeks. So what I think is going to happen, if you're going to grill me right now, I think that Drew doesn't win at Clash at the Castle, that he somehow is screwed out of it. Theory maybe screws him out of it. Theory has another failed cash in and Roman retains. Uh, That's what I think is going to happen. And then maybe Drew gets super angry and ends up standing tall at the end of that match, claymoring both guys, but doesn't carry it, doesn't win the championship. That's what I think happens, even though Clash like Wales is going to be one million percent behind Drew McIntyre. Like it's not even going to be one person cheering for Roman. I don't believe. They'll be excited to see Roman. I'm sure during his entrance you'll hear cheers because it's oh my gosh, Roman Reigns, he's finally here. This is awesome. But I think as the match goes on and as the the crowd starts to, you know, uh, realize what's in front of them, that Drew McIntyre is going to get, I mean, it's going to be like 99%, maybe 100% uh, for uh, Drew and 0% for Roman. But that said, I think when all is said and done, Drew is screwed out of the championship because of the Usos, because of uh, somebody unknown, because of a low blow, because of a foreign object, because of all three because of also Austin theory. There's going to be a lot of things that come against drew in this and end up screwing him out of the championship. And again, as I said, WWE's make good would be okay. Well, he didn't win, but he left Roman laying at the end of that match, holding up the belts, but he's not the champion. So, you know, it makes people feel good, but he didn't win. That's what I think is going to happen. At least in the short term through clash at the castle. I don't want to go beyond that because there's too many unknowns of does Drew have a rematch? Uh, does The Rock show up? Does Seth show up? That kind of stuff. You know, because Seth did declare he's going after uh, Roman on Raw, which tells you he's next in line, which tells you Drew isn't going to win the championship. See, that this is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem. And you could even make the argument for The Rock. So you could say, really, through The Rock, no one's going to win uh, the championship because The Rock would challenge Roman for the belt which I have been 1 million percent against the championship being involved in a Rock Roman match. So, all right, I'm going to get on a massive rant on this. Okay, Triple H took over, and you can already see a difference. I see a lot more people coming back and getting called up. Commander Aziz is now Cora Jade's bodyguard on NXT. Assuming they want to get him more polished, I would agree. The tag team match with the Usos and the Profits was great, but agree, it's not as good as the last one. I'm tired of them fighting, and they need to go their separate ways. Maybe more tag team call-ups or something. What do you think? Well, yeah, the Street Profits, do I think there's a little more juice to squeeze out of it if they want it? Sure. There's not a ton, but you know they could probably get a couple more months out of them being an, a well-oiled tag team if they wanted. But you could also easily make the argument equally... Uh, equally logical that the street profits should break up because Montez Ford is a single star waiting to happen. And Angelo Dawkins knows it. Angelo Dawkins knows he's second fiddle to Montez Ford because until Angelo Dawkins is insufferable, I'm not saying he's bad in the ring. He's good in the ring. Does he do things that he, that he, that a big man shouldn't do in the ring? Yes, he does. The suicide dives and flips over the ropes. I mean, he's going to kill some, kill himself or somebody else. And it also just makes him feel 
not unique because everyone does that. So he's a big man. He should work like a big man. And he doesn't. And he thinks that by doing these things that, oh, he shouldn't be able to do that. And, and by him doing that, it makes him feel unique. But in fact, you're doing the same thing everyone else is doing. Thereby, you are just being another, you're just being cut from the same cloth. So I, I'm not an Angelo Dawkins fan from a personality perspective. At least him and the Street Profits to me is insufferable. Uh, I can't stand his personality on camera. Good in the ring, but Montez Ford is 100% the star. I look forward to whenever he gets in the championship conversation, and that's going to be fun. The fans are going to be so behind him. It's going to be, it's going to be crazy because he can, he's got you know, charisma oozing through the screen. He can, we all know what kind of wrestler he is in the ring. Absolutely next level. He's young. People love him as it is. He's, he's an inherently likable guy. He's put on muscle. Right, like he and, and the announcers alluded to that this past week that he's actually put on a lot of muscle mass and he he has and it looks great. So, really, that's that's what I think. Okay, last, Liv is still champion. Figured they were gonna do it that way. Everything or everyone thinks Charlotte will go after Liv, but I still think her and Alexa are gonna connect because of destroying the doll. Yeah. So that's it. Next week. Okay. Well, thanks, Randy. I mean, I don't think that this is something that is is impossible. Now, Liv and Charlotte, I think, is something that's actually going to happen. In fact, I think Charlotte could be the one to take the belt off of Liv. But when you look, I mean, because somebody has to take the place of Ronda while she's out. And with Charlotte, who is a just a bona fide heel coming back, she would fit that nicely, taking out Liv while Ronda's on her suspension that really no one cares about, other than the fact she's now heel, which she should be. Uh, the thing is, with Alexa, she's on Raw. I mean, and Charlotte's on SmackDown. So let's pretend that there's an actual brand split right now. You can't have Liv, or rather Alexa and Charlotte, have anything to do with one another because they're on separate brands right now, right? I think they are. So that's the problem. I, I don't hate it, but I don't know if they're ever going to go back to it because Alexa and the doll, like no one cares about the doll anymore. Even though I thought that was going to be something that would eventually we'd get to with Alexa and Charlotte. Oh my God, she destroyed Lily. I actually don't think that's going to be the case now. I mean, Alexa and Charlotte could have a match, but it's going to be probably a while. All right, Randy. Thanks buddy. And now let's get to our uh, our next patron email. All right. Well, that is well. Let's find out here. This individual says, "Hey, Matt." You might have remembered chatting with my older brother, Mr. Dennis McGinley. Well, I had a fight with that heel and that old guy. I don't think he'll be ever coming back. So let me introduce myself. My name goes by Dennis D. Mac McGinley. I am, let's say, the nicer brother and would bring everyone down, uh, everyone down like my, like my older brother does and make insults too. I'm nothing like him. Well, it appears that Elias and... Uh, Ezekiel have seem, seemingly have had an effect on this individual. So uh, let's celebrate the Stone Cold Steve Austin way. Throw me a couple of beers. I'm feeling thirsty. So if you got this far, come out and get yourself a beer or two, because we all know, Roman, you part-timer, soon your time is up, and the Usos will be too for the whole bloodline. So, Matt, you must have missed Drew this past Saturday at SummerSlam when I was watching it on Peacock. Drew himself was or he did some talking and you notice that yo sky didn't doesn't have very good english not sure if that's on wwe's part or if she comes from i think japan i heard everyone have a blessed night i'll talk with you all and matt next week i'm out wow well dmac dennis dmac mcginley you have vanquished the heel of this show and you are you you are now taking the place of that just uh that beloved individual and i'm glad that dennis dmac mcginley is here to take the place of that old uh, that old person we don't talk about. So, first of all, yeah, I missed Drew, or at least I watched him. I must have been zoning out <laughs> because I had other people say that he's like Drew was on the pay per view. I'm like, oh crap, right? How embarrassing! I run a pay a podcast and I missed it. 
But that said, Drew didn't really say a whole lot other than talking about Clash at the Castle. However, yes, EO Sky doesn't have very good English. You know who doesn't else who also doesn't have very good English? Shinsuke Nakamura, Asuka, uh, you know, they didn't. And so I think that uh, when you look back, it's 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 not a huge deal, but I also think that if you're somebody coming over from another country and you know that the majority of your audience speaks English, wouldn't you want to put a lot of effort into making sure that you can improve your English to, you know, communicate with your audience? Because okay, fine, you can communicate them with them through body language or through music or through, oh, I do my talking in the ring. Yeah, well, eventually, you know what you're going to have to do? Actually talk, you use your voice box. And I think that when you have such broken English, it does create a barrier between you and the audience, or at least it, it puts a cap on, puts a ceiling on how effectively, how deeply you can connect with your audience. So, you know, hey, if she doesn't, she could still be a big star. But I just think inherently it's going to cause issues down the line. I mean, you see it with Asuka, big star, but she she never cuts a good promo because she doesn't have fluent English. So, yeah, hey, just my two cents. So uh, thank you, Mr. D-Mac. Great to hear from you. I'm glad that you took out the heel. I think we all are. All right. Now let's uh, let's continue on. I, I'm going to pull out my old... my um account here because those are all the patrons. However, however, we do have the non-patrons emails. We're going to get to them right now. This is from another Dennis, Dennis O'Brien. He says, Hey Matt, I hope this email finds you well. I was very impressed with SummerSlam. Logan Paul was surprisingly good. The return of Bailey and her new stable. I'm looking forward to seeing where they go with that. The main event was great, completely chaotic. The Triple H era has begun and I'm all for it. I'm actually looking forward to Raw for the first time in a long time. But a question for you, if WWE were to introduce a TLC match at WrestleMania, which I think they will, just a hunch, what three teams would you like to see in it? Ooh, well, first of all, I, would, I hope they do. And I hope they get rid of the TLC pay-per-view as a whole. I hope they get rid of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view as a whole because they are gimmick, man, they're gimmick pay-per-views. I don't need something that was felt, that felt special when it happened to be just part of the schedule. I don't know if Triple H has any plans on that, but let's pretend that he does. And let's pretend that it's TLC that happens every single uh, WrestleMania. Um, I think that if you're going to put the three teams in there hmm, at WrestleMania, mm -hmm, assuming RK Bros together, the Usos, what about the Alpha Academy? Now, I wouldn't hate that. Because the Street Profits will be broken up by then. And honestly, RK Bro will probably be broken up by then. So if you look at it realistically, by the teams that are actually surviving by the time WrestleMania rolls around, you have what? I, I can't even say the Dirty Dogs, because Dolph Ziggler is doing something with Theory that we're all supposed to forget about, um, that never got followed up on, by the way. Told you, they have no idea what the hell they're doing there. Um, so the Dirty Dogs don't exist. You have the Viking Raiders, excuse me, the vicious Viking Raiders, because you got to have some silly adjective in there. So you have the Viking Raiders. Uh, you have Alpha Academy. The Street Profits are going to be broken up. RK Bro is going to be broken up. Who's left? <laughs> I mean, really, somebody from NXT? I'm probably missing a tag team somewhere in there. Uh, the Usos, you know? So there, how about that? There you go. Uh, that, that pretty much rounds it out if they're going to do a TLC match. So, cool. Thank you, Dennis. And let's continue on with the next email here. And... This is from Jeff. Jeff, I believe from the Philippines here, he writes in and says, For what I know, the rules of a last man standing match is a wrestler continues to inflict more damage to his opponent. If a wrestler continues to inflict more damage, the referee stops the count. However, at SummerSlam, the referee didn't stop counting when the bloodline keeps on piling on a number of objects to Brock. Yeah, so I know what you're saying. And... Even in the video games, I believe the, the way that, the, not that we're supposed to use video games as a standard, but they're supposed to mimic the WWE rules. And if somebody starts inflicting more punishment, the count starts over. However, logically, shouldn't it be that as long as the person's on their back, or rather it's down, which means just seemingly unconscious or, or knocked out, that no matter, even if, you're, even if you're still inflicting punishment when they're on their back or on the ground, should that really matter in restarting the count? I mean, again, 
the, the, there's an argument to be made for both ways because the video game, every video game that I've ever played with WWE does do that. But in reality, as long as they're down, what does it matter? You know, but I hear what you're saying. So number two, I think the ring name change for Io Shirai to Io Sky was a last minute decision because the screen at SummerSlam still showed her former ring name. Oh, good observation. Je- I did not miss or I did miss that, Jeff, along with Drew McIntyre, because I am just a like an empty vessel of uh, mindlessness at times. Um, also, this past Monday in Raw, Corey Graves said that if EO wins against Bianca, that that would bring her to the front of the line for our Raw Women's Championship match. This means that every non-title match against a champion is a championship contenders match. <laughs> Jeff, you're catching on now. This concept is something that is so hit and miss and is there when it needs to be to make the match feel more important than it is. But at the same time, you have people who win a match that's not labeled a contenders match and then have a championship match the next week. You want a good example? The the Mysterios. They won at SummerSlam, right? But that match against the Judgment Day was not labeled as a championship contenders match. Now, does every championship contenders match need to contain the champion? I don't know. The rules are very vague. And what a championship contenders match actually means is very vague other than, oh, they're in the title picture. Well, isn't everyone by default? Where exactly does this placement place them in the line of people who are trying to contend for that championship? It's just there's no logic to this, Jeff. I'm sorry. I know. So but as far as this, if if Io Shirai, Io Sky, I actually like Io Shirai better because Io Sky and Dakota Kai, there's, there's too much. I, Kai, my, Sai. I mean, there's too much. <laughs> but as far as this goes, does it make sense that now Eos, Eos Sky is in line for a championship match? No, it doesn't make sense. Why? She just got here. Why? Even if she beat the champion outright, what, what, you know, why does that automatically put her in the, in the title picture? You know, like maybe Bianca had a bad night. So I don't know. They won't label this as a championship contenders match. Maybe they got rid of that terminology altogether. I hope they do because it means nothing. Excuse me. So, yeah. Uh, all right. Number three. I didn't like that the Judgment Day lost at SummerSlam. They could have made them win against the Mysterios and then do Edge's return after. They don't feel like a threat. That's all. Thank you till next time. Well, I agree that the Judgment Day has had been a complete and utter mess since they ousted Edge. And... Having the Judgment Day lose at SummerSlam, I agree, was just made no sense. But they, the only reason that the Judgment Day apparently lost is because Ju- uh, Edge interfered. It's not like, you know, the, they, they beat the Mysterios clean, or the Mysterios beat the Judgment Day clean. Edge interfered on the Mysterios' behalf. So that's the, that's the rub on this whole thing. It's, all, it's really circled around Edge. It has nothing to do with the Mysterios actually winning even though they won and earned a championship match the next night on Raw, or two nights later on Raw, when it wasn't labeled a contender's match, yet they earned a championship opportunity. See, these are where the rules just apply, don't apply, only when they need to, storyline-wise. It's very inconsistent. So, thank you, Jeff. Now, let's get to, my goodness, my goodness, Rocky T. (laughs) You have, you've taken DJ Kuzumo's spot in terms of length of email, you know, I gotta say. So, let's... (laughs) Let's get through this as, as quickly as we can. I do appreciate it, though, Rocky. So let's let's get through it here. This is Rocky T from Houston, and he says that it's been a couple weeks. Life just caught up to me and work. I'm a little disappointed that I didn't get to touch base with you and set up a time for us to talk about what went down on Raw after SummerSlam from a fan's point of view since I was in attendance. So here are my notes. Well, thank you, Rocky. I appreciate that. And hey, life, I get it. First thing, the main event was taped before Raw. Honorable mention for Shelton Benjamin. He got a nice pop from the crowd when his music hit. The fans cheered, and he got good pops during his moves during the match. It was a one-on-one match against T-Bar. Even in the loss, Benjamin got cheered as he exited the ring and walked backstage. Yeah, not surprising. Shelton Benjamin is a guy that is just so underrated. You know, and obviously it's too late in the game for him to uh, have any kind of push, but Shelton is a hell of an athlete. After the opening segment, when Raw cut to a commercial after Becky was attacked backstage, the crowd popped hard with boos for the attack, and then was immediately followed up with Bailey, Bailey chants. A cool thing that the audience experienced that the viewers at home did not 
is the WWE version of the Kiss Cam called the DX Cam, where they point to random fans throughout the arena to do their DX chops. Wow. We're still doing that, huh? <laughs> 20 years later, we're still doing this? Really? Who? Okay, maybe this is, not, this is kind of a, a tip to the fact that WWE is going TV 14. I mean, what are they going to do? What if they point, point to a kid who's with their, their mom and the, the kid just does a DX chop? Right. That kid's probably grounded. <laughs> so, um, yikes. Hilarious, though. I'd rather have a DX cam than the Kiss cam. No doubt. Okay. Whether you love him or hate him or just feel indifferent about the guy, The Miz is over. Even though you hear the boos and the tiny balls chants on TV, there are individual people in the crowd who actually cheer for him, and I'm one of those people. The man knows how to work a crowd, and I didn't always like the guy, but as a 15-plus-year vet, you have to give the man respect. He's a two-time Grand Slam champion. People love to hate the Miz, and and that's part of the reason why he's had his long tenure. If you're not marketable, WWE just won't keep you. He may not be a great, quote, wrestler in the sense of being a technical guy, a high flyer, or even know for his power or known for his power and strength, but he's a great, quote, superstar, still drawing eyes to the product after over 15 years. I still enjoy his seeing his face get punched. He has been entrusted to carry the load in matches with Brad, uh, oh, Bad Money, Logan Paul, etc. If he were to retire today, he has segmented his legacy and no doubt will be inducted in the Hall of Fame. Plenty of tiny balls chances you heard on the telecast, but also let's go Miz chance from the individual crowd, uh, individuals in the crowd that do not project on screen to the at-home viewers. Well, Rocky, um, look, I crap on the Miz here. Admittedly, I will never back down on that, but it's only because his lack of evolution as a character. I'm not saying he doesn't know how to work a crowd. I'm not saying he doesn't cut good promos. I'm just saying I'm not interested in what The Miz does at all. I'm not saying he's not good at the promos again. He's not a bad wrestler. None of that. He's got a good presence. Yeah, he's a 15-year vet. Even though he still looks like the first day he walked in, the guy has not aged. But he also hasn't evolved in character, in what he does. Miz TV is insanely overused to the point of just, just insufferability. Uh, he and John Morrison were one of the worst things I've ever seen on Raw when they were together. They were an embarrassment, not in terms of ability or anything, just in terms of just being 15-year-old boys. Um, but you know, I mean, so that, that's why I crap on it. It's more of an evolution, not Miz the person. The Miz the person seems like a genuinely nice guy. He's got kids, all that. It's wonderful. But the character, the Miz, they sh- he should be inducted in the Hall of Fame for being one of the few characters to, to survive this long and not have any kind of evolution at all. Same catchphrases, same TV shows, same outfits, same ring gear, same moves. And it's amazing he's able to been able to have, be the successful with all of that. Uh, so that's why I crap on it. There's just nothing to grasp onto with The Miz. It's just the same all the time. That's the problem. That's why I crap on it. But yeah, I mean, hey, if you're a fan of him, cool. Like, that's great. Yeah, do what you want to do. So... Another note, besides the seats they block off for stage and then Titan Tron, it's a, it was a packed house. It was 95% full. The only empty seats were those in the section of the hard cam. I'm not sure the technical term for the camera where the wrestlers face. Yep, no, it's the hard cam. Uh, that's exactly what it is. Yep, uh, when Booker T was announced for commentator, it might have been the biggest pop of the night as you'd expect with a hometown boy. Yeah, <laughs> it, you know, Booker T on commentary is a loose cannon. And he always, I remember when he was on Raw on a weekly basis, he barely made sense half the time. I mean, he he's also doesn't have a very soft or very uh, just listenable voice for long periods of time. It's raspy. And some people like that because it's unique. But to me, it's just, it's, it's, it's a voice I need to hear sparingly because of the way his voice actually sounds. It's just not my thing. But also he, he would say things and do things that just don't make sense. I remember the random comments he would make during a show. And it's like, Booker, what? Hey, what, what, stop like what are you even saying you know Booker T legend no doubt about it Booker T's a legend and I, I, I'm sure and I'm glad he got the pop in Houston but I do have to say he's just not my favorite commentator he's entertaining he's got his own podcast and successful guy but uh, him on commentary every week is not something I would ever go back to okay overall great show I'm looking forward to the future one-on-one between Becky and Bailey <clears throat> based on the attack and Becky turning face 
Great to see the U.S. title showcased the way it was. I agree with you, hoping they do the same with the IC. After all, it's my favorite, uh, the white strap version. Yeah, that was the biggest takeaway for me on Raw. It was not the baby face turn, full turn for Becky or anything. It was the respect given back to the United States Championship. That was such a big deal to me uh, because it's a forgotten championship, sadly. And the IC needs some work too, but thank God it's around the waist of Gunther. Okay, one last thing before I go. Seth Rollins is so freaking over. Well, don't you mean Seth freaking Rollins is so freaking over? (laughs) I know he's a heel. There were let's go Seth chants during the match in the crowd. I don't think it translated on TV to the home audience. WWE needs to put a title on this man. No matter what, I don't think we will ever not see Seth as a title contender threat. I believe he's the only man that could pull double duty like Roman if WWE decides not to split the Universal and WWE championships. Yeah, Seth can do... I mean, Seth is always a constant threat, but he's lost so many big matches. And somebody say, oh, well, if you don't know how to lose in pro wrestling, you don't know what wrestling is about. There comes a breaking point, though. Like, I mean, okay, yeah, losing isn't really the worst thing in wrestling, but when you lose consistently on big stages, it undermines your credibility where the fans are going to go, yeah, well, he, he does seem like a good threat. He's a good talker. He's over. But you know he's going to lose the big match. And that's essentially what Seth Rollins has become. And that's a problem. But, uh, yeah, Seth being over is not surprising here in the crowd. The crowd uh, were chanting for Seth, and I, I do believe it. And it, it, I would love to know the last time Seth held a singles championship. If somebody could pull that stat for me, it's got to be something mind-blowing. P.S. I remember you asking what the meaning of Theory's finish, A Town Down, and I'm not sure anyone has given you the answer. His hometown's Atlanta, Georgia, and I think that refers to his home city. I'm from Houston, Texas, and we refer to the city as H Town, so I assume if he were from Houston, the finish would be H Town Down. Yeah, I, I, that's what I, 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 I kind of deciphered or decoded part of that. A Town Down, blah, 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 I don't know the rest of his song, but like. Okay, you're from A-Town, Atlanta, which is actually called Hotlanta. A lot of people call it Hotlanta, you know, so, but fine, let's go with A-Town as Atlanta. But, like, what is A-Town, okay, Atlanta down? A-Town down? Like, what, what's the down part? And I, I still don't get it. Maybe just because town and down rhyme? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm overthinking it. But it just, I'm just like, A-Town down. Like, what, what the hell does that exactly mean? All right. I know you do not like the term WWE Universe, and I touched on this a few months back, explaining how your podcast is a rabbit hole for fans consisting of all wrestling news updates and match-by-match breakdowns of each show throughout the week for those fans who do not have time to watch the show every week. If Nasser here in Houston was making a time capsule to send out into the actual universe for other planets and life forms to find, I would vote to have the entire WWE podcast you guys produce to be a part of informing other life beings of pro wrestling here on Earth. That's it. Does it for now. By P.S. I'm still upset WWE broke the Iconics, so not uh, not Fetch. <laughs> yeah. Fetch isn't going to happen. It's not a thing. But, I mean, the WWE Universe term, I still, <clears throat> it's never going to happen. It's To me, it's, it's Fetch. It's never going to happen. I can't get used to it. I think it's a silly corporate term. They can't, for some reason, they can't just call them fans. Every other major sport calls their fans exactly what they are fans and for some reason they can't just say wwe fans why what, what's wrong is there some derogatory term i'm missing universe sound nobody who speaks like that like that's not something that organically comes out of somebody's mouth during a promo it just still feels forced it's like it's just somebody cutting a promo wanting to say fans and they're like oh wait i can't say fans i have to say universe Right. Or when they can't say wrestler, they have to say superstar, you know, uh, which I also have a huge problem with. Again, it's all perception. Superstar, they're trying to redefine as somebody who immediately signs with WWE. Triple H even said it on the Impulsive podcast, which, by the way, I'd actually go recommend listening to. Triple H went on for about an hour on Paul Logan Paul's podcast. And that was quickly brought up that Logan Paul said he's not quite a superstar yet. And Triple H said, no, 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 you are. The second you sign with WWE, you're a superstar. It's like, no, dude, stop trying to redefine what a superstar is. A superstar is somebody that has earned that name. You're, you're just, you're a rookie. You're, 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 you can call yourself a professional wrestler. That's fine. But if you're going to get rid of the pro wrestling term, that's why they've said, well, we're just going to go with superstar. It's like, no, a superstar is something like superstar is our big, if you're a star, 
you don't you're not automatically a super superstar the second you walk in that would be like saying a musician who signs a record deal with somebody right that they're instantly a superstar it's like no 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 they're not they're just a musician right now they're an aspiring musician they're you know they're not a superstar it'd be like somebody signing with the yankees in the minor leagues or say say even in the big leagues they came up through the minor leagues they came up and all of a sudden they're just automatically a superstar it's like no, superstars are Derek Jeter, Alex Rodriguez, you know, Jorge Posada, uh, you know, right now, currently Aaron Judge, Glaber Torres. Like you go down the list of guys right now in the Yankees. Um, those are superstars. But you're just automatically just given that title when you sign. No, that's not how other sports work. So I don't buy into that, that like language uh, kind of manipulation. All right, so we got one more email. I thought I was done. I got one more email that uh, somebody sent in, and that's from Seth Butler. And he says, I heard the latest episode of the current state of WWE, and you and Anthony couldn't be more right about Edge and the Judgment Day. If you, if I can give my fantasy booking of how this could be played out, here it is. Instead of roaming having both belts, the WWE title should have stayed on Raw. Lesnar could have had a big feud with Lashley at WrestleMania last year, and a WWE championship could have re- had relevance on the red brand. In turn, Edge on the Mountain of Omnipotence as a big dark heel could have challenged Brock at SummerSlam, have Edge win, have Edge again at Clash of the Castle against Lesnar, and move Edge into a feud with Bobby Lashley. Lashley versus Edge and the Judgment Day for weeks heading into Crown Jewel, ultimately leading to Edge again retaining the title. Survivor Series would be another interesting matchup. Edge versus Reigns, both backed by their factions in a champion versus championship match. A champion versus championship champion match. The next night, while the Judgment Day has enough fire under them with Edge, they turn on Edge. Finn claims the vacant WWE title. Priest wins the Rumble. Edge returns at uh, Elimination Chamber and it becomes a triple threat match at WrestleMania next year. There were so many ways this could have worked out. Edge had so much potential as a heel. It could have worked out with Lesnar, Lashley, Rhodes, etc. I'm very over underwhelmed. Edge deserves better. Yeah, he does. <laughs> I'm sure Edge, if you put truth serum in him, he would say this. It was ridiculous that they stopped the Judgment Day when they did. He kind of teased it a little bit in his promo by saying, you know, we just had something getting going and boom, you guys turned on me. It was a wink and a nod to, hey, yeah, I know they cut the news on uh, my legs out from underneath me. But I mean, yours, your your fantasy booking here isn't it's not crazy, but I don't see WWE ever doing this, putting so much stock in the Judgment Day with all three of these guys with Finn, Damian and Edge leading to a triple threat. I just I don't think that's the case. And I don't think they want Edge back in the title picture right now. Um, And I don't want Edge in the title picture right now. Edge, you know, I I think is at the point, like Brock Lesnar, of being an attraction where, and Edge a little bit more so than Brock, because he's there more. But Edge versus Brock, that's fun. I want Brock out of the title picture because then it creates a lot more unpredictability where you don't go, well, Brock's in the title picture. He's, you know, he's part time. He's not going to be here. They don't want another absentee champion. And getting Brock out of the title picture is much more fun because then he has actual opportunity to win matches and and have it be more unpredictable. And that's where Brock, I think, and WWE have really kind of faltered as they just jolt Brock into the title picture. You know, he's there to just put guys over and leave and get millions of dollars to do it. I just I'm with you on edge, though. I think that he deserves better. We didn't get that 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 heel character didn't get a chance to breathe, man. It just got going. I was just I was like, this is going to be freaking awesome. And bleh, a womp womp, right? Edge does deserve better, you know, and, and, you know, maybe we'll all eat our words. Maybe you and I and everybody else. And I hope I do. I hope I eat my words with what they've done with edge because I, that means that WWE did their job. You know, so. All right, that is it with the emails. Time to dive into voicemails. You guys ready? Here we go. Hey, it's Kyle from Baltimore. So I want to talk about last night's first SummerSlam and mainly the first match with Becky and Bianca. Of course, it was a good match, but the end of that, seeing A, Becky at baby face again, which needed to happen, and B, Bailey coming back and Io Shirai and Dakota Kai back at WWE is crazy. I'm not a big Bailey fan, but to see Io Shirai and Dakota Kai on the main roster and back at WWE is crazy to me to see. And I am, it was, it was a great moment. I don't see what they do on Monday. Maybe this call is now Sunday. So I'm going to just call before Raw tomorrow. But 
I am see what they're going to do with all three of them as this new faction. And the fact that this is this had happened was Becky turned to a baby face and now Ronda's a heel after she lost to Liv, which I'm glad that happened, even though now the main point is Ronda's a heel, Becky's a baby face, and Bailey's back from injury. Good, good to see that. And EO and Dakota are now on Monday Night Raw. Just crazy to see, but that's my two thoughts on that. But that's it. Thanks for the call. Bye. Kyle, good to hear from you. And look, right now, it's Bailey. It's the Bailey show when it comes to the women's division. I wouldn't even be surprised if she shows up on SmackDown with her group that has yet to be named. We need a name for this group, by the way. I think that they're probably formulating that because we can't just keep, you know, saying Bailey's team or, you know, like <laughs> there needs to be a name. But for right now, I think that you will see Bailey's faction run rough shot, not just over Raw, but over SmackDown while she, her home is on Raw. And she'll eventually challenge Bianca for the Raw Women's Championship. I think she could run rough shot over SmackDown and uh, just to start assaulting women on SmackDown, not get in the championship picture there. So other women, maybe just assault Natalia or like the, the kind of throwaway talent. I say that respectfully, but the people that aren't involved in a title match, she could just, you know, just send a message because they're going to be talking about that. And that was the narrative pushed on Raw is that the WWE or Bailey has put the women's division on notice, you know? So I think that's the narrative that will be pushed moving forward. And I like it. So that could be what they do. And, uh, you know, EO Shirai or rather EO sky, um, and Dakota Kai are also going to be made big stars out of this. And that's a great thing. Bailey is at a, a level now where she could be a leader of a group and I'm loving this. And I don't know the last time there was a women's faction, the riot squad, maybe, Went to the Riot Squad the last time that there was a legit faction in WWE for the women, you know, um, so loving it, loving it. I, I agree. All right. Next voicemail. Hey, man, it's Justin from Maryland. Just had a couple of topics I want to discuss. There's so much to talk about, so little time. So let me see if I can get through it. First, I'm excited for the women's division. It was good to see Bailey and uh, Dakota Kai return. Uh thought that they were going to go to SmackDown because Raw already has a lot of uh, stars, but I'm guessing that Charlotte will probably return to SmackDown. Hopefully, Sasha Banks and Naomi, when they come back, they go to SmackDown. So, I guess we're going to get Bailey and Bianca for the world title. Um, that still leaves where Rhea's going to be. It seems like she's stuck in the Edge program right now. So, it's just interesting because you still got Alexa Bliss. And then, um, yeah, so I guess they're going to go with Bailey and uh, Bianca. Hopefully they, they bring back the women's tag titles now since they have a, a women's stable. I feel like that would be great to see them with the women's world championship and the tag titles. So just hoping to see see that. And it was good to see Ronda turn heel. Um, she's suspended, but I'm sure that she'll probably get the rematch at Class of the Castle. I'm not sure if she'll retain, but hopefully not. Next is the Edge return. I wasn't really excited for it. For one, a WWE announced it on their Twitter that he was going to return at SummerSlam. And then he came back during the match, and what I didn't want to see is him help them win. I didn't want to see that. I wanted him to either return when it was over after the mysterious loss or have him return and help Judgment Day win, but we didn't get any of that. And uh, now he's still stuck in the in the uh, storyline of Mysterio's in there, so he's spirit Dominic. So hopefully that's the start of something. Maybe Dominic can blame uh, Edge and he'll start turning on his father or something, but hopefully Edge spirit Dominic is a sign of Dominic turning heel. Uh, Seth, it was good to see him pick up wins over Montez and uh, beat down Riddle. Um, I like how he mentioned Roman. I know we're definitely going to get that match again. I don't know when, but it's good to see that he still has Roman on his mind. And uh, whenever Riddle comes back, uh, their match will be fun. Finally, uh, the Street Profits, I thought that we were going to get a breakup. It seems like they're starting to build that because when they did the little rock, paper, scissors, Montez didn't even 
do it, he just ran to the ring. So I feel like Angelo Dawkins, one of them is going to turn. I want to see Montez be a heel, but I feel like the fans will probably like, will probably gravitate to him more. So that's that'd be interesting to see. Um, but they're definitely building that, so we'll definitely get a. Hi, <laughs> Justin. Yeah, you run that until the wheels fall off, don't you? That that three minutes. <laughs> I love it. But yeah, you cram a lot of good stuff in here. So, okay, <clears throat> a couple of things. Bailey and Bianca, that's happening. It's yeah. I, while I said they could build it to WrestleMania, that's way too far. I think that what they're going to do is have a series of matches, and the blow off could be Bailey and Bianca at WrestleMania with also Rhea involved. I mean, you could put Rhea, Bianca, and Bailey in a triple threat match at WrestleMania. I'm not a big fan of triple threats, but that's kind of been WWE's mo. We'll see if Triple H, under the guidance of Triple H, if that still is the case. I just, you know, but I could see that being a triple threat at WrestleMania. Um, but this matchup with Bailey could happen. Their very first one could happen at the uh, Clash of the Castle event. It could, unless they're involved in that six person tag match that I alluded to earlier with the Judgment Day and the Mysterials and Edge. But if they're going to do this match, they could do it and have a tag team match between, um, you know, the, the Usos or, or rather the Usos. The Judgment Day and Edge and the Mysterials. The problem is, though, that, uh, you know, we have a three on two scenario favoring the baby faces. So that doesn't really work. But this is going to be a series of matches with Bailey and Bianca. This is going to be a series. So expect that to drag out for several months, as it should. The women's, ta- women's tag belts coming back. Yes, I expect that to happen over the next couple of months. I just don't want them to. And I know Triple H is some seemingly on board, at least from everything I heard, I've heard and everything that seems to be coming out of his mouth that he wants to reintroduce championships in a way that are respectful. That makes sense. You're not just going to throw them back out there. You got to have a plan. You got to have established women's tag teams, that kind of thing. And I, I don't want them to bring back those belts until they have a plan until they're, they actually have established teams who are, you know, in a tournament, they don't just, you know, throw random people together and call them a tag team. There needs to be some groundwork, some foundational work made and not just an afterthought. And then women's tag belts have been nothing more. Generally speaking, there's been some bright spots, but generally the women's tag team belts have been an afterthought and they've been a curse more than a blessing for whoever holds them. Okay. Now are you, you're bored by the edge return. Yep. Me too. <laughs> I mean, that was probably the worst thing they could have done with Edge. You know, again, Edge is a star, a true superstar. He, and by the way, did anyone else notice on Raw? It might have been whoever the announcer is. They they did the Tony Chimmel thing. That the, the he, they called him the Rated R Superstar, kind of a wink and a nod to fans. Or Tony Ch- uh, Ch- is it Tony Chimmel? I think I'm I think it's Tony. I, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But but that was like the most boring way to bring Edge back. Instead of having him turn on the Mysterios. However, if this leads to Dom turning heel, to me, is it worth this Edge coming back as a baby face? I guess. Just to see what Dom as a heel looks like. Because that's how badly I want Dominic to be a heel. Uh, and yeah, I, I you, know, you said this could be the start of something with Dom. I don't see how this couldn't be anything other than that. Why would you have this angle end the show? To just say to each other, you know, have Edge say to Dominic, oh, I'm sorry, man. Dom's like, no problem. I understand you accidentally hit me. And they move on. No, this has to be the start of something. So, all right. Thanks, Justin. Looking forward to hearing from you next week. And let's get to our final voicemail. Hello, Matt. Hello, WWE podcast family. Alex, the French guy here, your European champion. Uh, I wanted to ask you the, the exact same question I asked. Um, Mr. Casual Wrestling Fan, which is um, with, with the impression that we are coming to an end to the PG era. It's not official yet. Maybe we are not coming to an end, but I would like to ask you what is maybe your favorite um, moment of the PG era? Not particularly maybe the, the, the first one, but maybe a top three. Like uh, what, what was your favorite for me as far as i can remember when i started watching wrestling it was during i think uh the feud between um john cena and edge in 2006 but it was before the pg era and uh ever since the pg era if i can call it that way 
it's 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 the name after all. So the PG era, the 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 best few that I really enjoyed was the Yes Movement with Daniel Bryan and WrestleMania 30 in a whole. I think was a real good WrestleMania with the two main facts being the 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 the, the high point of the Yes Movement and um, the Undertaker streak being over. First, because uh, the Yes Movement and Daniel Bryan was really like a, in a, a real organic storyline, and I think the best one are the ones that the public wants and the, the fans that, that the, the fans wanted that to happen. So in that way, that happens. And uh, the the culminating point, I think, in WWE recent history. Daniel Bryan, Daniel Bryan, yes, movement was the very best uh, underdog story, which is always something that will work, I think, in the, in the WWE. So that and uh, yes, the the end of the yes movement was really like something that is uh, as as big as it gets during the years, and uh, even more. More important than a championship, I remember being a child and uh, beating the streak was the ultimate achievement, uh, more than winning uh, 10 championships, and uh, I really think that way still. So with that in mind, I see you uh, next week, I hope, and uh, enjoy your week, guys. Alex, that's a hell of a question, and I think it's a great one, not just because... I haven't really been asked it and I'm not hearing a whole lot about it, but because it's something that I think would put a little bit of respect and admiration into the PG era where I have at times too crapped on the PG era for going soft. It goes from a, a teen adult product to a children's product. And that had some jarring, jarring uh, changes that WWE made. And, you know, John Cena really at the forefront of it being essentially a children and women's hero where the men hated him because he was such a stark contrast to Stone Cold and The Rock. But that's a hell of a question. Honestly, it's one that you can make an entire podcast out of is a review of the PG era, like WWE's PG era or something. You could really do so much with it. Off the top of my head, there's so much that came across the PG era. I don't, I don't know about a top three, but here's some of my top ones off the top. And this is not in any particular order. How about Stone Cold Steve Austin returning to the ring? Just happened. That, that happened in the PG era. How about Shawn Michaels retiring at WrestleMania 26? Or putting on arguably the greatest WrestleMania match of all time at WrestleMania 25 in Houston? Okay, how about the Nexus? How about CM Punk's pipe bomb? All of this happened in the PG era. The PG era has provided some amazing moments from 2008 until now. Now, that's 14 years. It may continue. But it has provided some... How about the Rock... And John Cena, part one and two. How about Brock Lesnar returning to WWE after seven years? So much to talk about. And yours, I can't dispute any of those. Those are great moments too. The streak ending, the yes movement, all of it. All of this happened in the PG era where a lot of us look back and go, oh, PG, bleh. right? And it's had some terrible moments too. Suffering Succotash, Roman Reigns' babyface run was awful as a, as a whole because the fans didn't want him as a babyface. The Shield debuting, though. How about that? The, as I said, the Nexus. John Cena versus the Nexus. There's a lot of great stuff. Ric Flair's retirement. You know, all these things. It's amazing what happened in the PG era. So that is honestly a too deep of a topic for me to get into now, but it's a hell of a one that... It's one that is a hell of a topic that we should have time to explore, and maybe you guys can give me your thoughts, too, on your top three, top five moments of the PG era. Great topic. Great topic. So, all right, Alex, thank you to you yourself and to everybody listening. I really do appreciate it. We're about an hour in. I'm trying to keep the mailbags to about an hour for time reasons and uh, listenability and all that. But thank you for all of your contributions. Everyone who emailed in all of our patrons, you can join our patrons and go ad free at patreon.com slash WWE podcast for a dollar. You get in the door with discord server, all everything ad free and a bunch more shout outs on the show. And uh, you know, it's just a great place to be. And, and I, I do want to give a shout out to David Gerwicks who has joined us on Patreon much appreciated, brother. And he, he now has access to the Discord server among everybody else. And 
That is it for me. Again, join me every Saturday for a one-hour video show on the DuPont Network, D-U-P-O-N-T, now.com. Sign up 100% free, and you can also join us on Apple Podcasts to go ad-free for 99 cents a month or our website at wwepodcast.com. Thank you, everybody. That's it for me this week. I'll be back for your Week in Review this Sunday night. Until then, take care, and I'll talk to you next time. Thanks for listening to the WWE Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE Podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.